We're live. Good evening. Good evening. Ladies Good evening. and gentlemen, can you hear me? Even the people in the back? Yes? Does the microphone work? Okay. Works. Can we see you? I am going to admit to you that it, it takes a lot to get me nervous. Uh, tonight I'm a little nervous. Uh, this is my first time interviewing my grandmother. I've seen her interviewed on stage in front of 500 people. And it's such an incredible honor to be sitting next to her. And it has only been 10 seconds since I started talking, and I'm starting to cry already. So I'm worried. <laughs> but I grew up on my grandmother's knee with her telling me stories about what it means to have gone through the war. Now, when I was a little girl, I thought that all grandparents were Holocaust survivors, because all four of my grandparents were survivors. And when I met people in school, and the subject might come up, which was very rare, only when you were a bit older, and they would say that their grandparents grew up in America, I said, then they're Jewish? Your grandparents are Jewish? How could that be? Um, and I think what's unique about the opportunity that we have tonight to be sitting in front of my grandmother and to hear her story is that when I was younger, when I was in high school, or even the years after high school, it wasn't necessarily such a rare opportunity to be able to hear a Holocaust survivor speak about what she went through and what he went through. And today it's getting more and more rare. And my grandmother, who's sitting next to me this morning, almost didn't come. Do you mind if I say? She almost didn't come because she wasn't feeling well. And it's a schlep to Miami Beach. And I said, Bubby. There's not many people like you that could do this. <coughs> and you have a hundred people coming tonight to listen to you speak. She said, oh, okay, fine, I'll come. But she's <laughs> throwing in Bobby's house. Yes. <laughs> so I want to thank my grandmother for coming to speak to us tonight, even though it was incredibly difficult. And I want to thank my father, who also is a very busy man who came to accompany me in this interview. And my father will um, contribute as what, um, what it meant to grow up as a child of a Holocaust survivor. And he will also fill in some of the pieces that my grandmother might not recall anymore and hopefully will get a, a complete testimony. So it was 2010 that my husband and I traveled to London. We were going there for an interview for a job that we ended up taking, but um, we had four days all expenses paid vacation that the organization that wanted to hire us wanted to send us on you know a good tourist vacation for us. So they gave us pocket money and they gave us a car and they said go have fun in the city. So we asked some of the students what are some of the fun things to do around town. And uh, a few suggestions came up and someone said the London Dungeons. Now if you've been to the London Dungeons, that's fine. If you haven't, don't go. <laughs> it's probably one of the tackiest, most crass places I've ever been to in my life. Um, and we walked in, and I think we went, I think it was, we lasted about seven minutes until we finally left. And the, one of the reasons why we left was because, um, if you know any history of the London Dungeons, it was a pretty horrific place, historically, where they used to torture some of their, um, the convicts, they used to torture prisoners, information, and they would leave people there to die. Now what did this become, the London Dungeons? Decade after decade after decade passed. Now it's an amusement park. It's a place where you can go and actors make fun about what they used to do with the prisoners. You can get popcorn, you can get ice cream, and you can walk out and say that was really funny, that was humorous. And I think the difference between that experience and, let's say, touring Auschwitz is just in my opinion a matter of time. I know it's a hard thing to hear, but if you go to Auschwitz today, do you know that there is an ice cream shop in Auschwitz? Right outside of Auschwitz, they built an ice cream shop. And maybe there might be hot dogs, or they might sell something else. But after a matter of time, when there isn't someone who went through it themselves, who felt the pain themselves to talk to you about it, when there aren't people left to actually share their pain, it's hard to feel the pain yourself. And the, the amazing gift that we have tonight 
is to be able to hear it firsthand from someone so the pain will never be lost. So we'll never become immune or numb to what our family and what our grandparents went through, and we'll be able to pass it on like a precious diamond from generation to generation. You'll say, I was there. I heard it. I know it. It happened. So without further ado, this is going to be somewhat interview style, but my grandmother always adds her, her flair to it. Um, I'm having a conversation with my grandmother just like I did when I was a kid, and my father as well. And I invite you into our living room to, to share in the experience of, share, of passing on that diamond from one person to the next. So Bobby, I want to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? Yes. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know. Except talk louder because I'm a little deaf. <laughs> a little deaf. Not a lot. I just want to tell you all that this past Chavez, my mother celebrated her 95th birthday. <laughs> They are those bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on, shoot. Okay. <laughs> Please describe your life before the Holocaust. Huh? What? Please describe your life before the Holocaust. Uh, it wasn't very exciting. Because my father died when I was very young. And we had a little store with my mother. So I used to help her in this store. But when my father died, then everything went the wrong way. I could not help so much in this store when all kaput. And that's what my life stopped going down and down. Mm. What was your family like? How many siblings did you have? Mm -hmm. How many siblings did you have? I had one sister, which I don't know what I did. Her name was Ronella. That's who Toby is named after. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. so your first grandchild was named after your sister. Right. Yes. Was your family religious? Yes, very. What was your mother like and your grandmother like? Your grandmother is who I'm named after. Yeah. Shana. Shana, yeah. Dina Shana. She was the, the best grandmother you can imagine somebody can have. She was so good to me, so good, unbelievable. I was counting the days to go and visit her. Do you remember what town you were from? Hmm? Do you remember the name of the town that you were from? Yeah. What's the name? Common Kushels. Five points if you can pronounce that at the end of the evening. <laughs> What was your community like? Oh, well, it was uh, a Yiddish community. We didn't have conservative, or we didn't have to reforms. We had plain Yiddin, and that's what we had. A Jew was a Jew was a Jew was a Jew. A Jew, a Jew is a Jew. <laughs> Lesson number until, one. Until it's lucky. Uh -huh. Yes. Do you remember experiencing anti-Semitism when you were growing up before the war? Absolutely. They used to send me to Palestine. You don't want the long head here. We had some, uh, lots of land. I don't know how, uh, who bought it, but we had a lot of land. And of course, we used to work on this, on this land. And uh, they resented it because Everything, unfortunately to them, was growing beautifully. Mm -hmm. So they resenting us. So they said they go to Palestine. You don't belong here. That's not your country. Your country is Palestine. 
that means Israel. How did you feel about that? Huh? How did you feel? I felt very bad about that, that we were living in a place that they don't want us here. You know? And it wasn't very easy to live in this kind of place, and yet to make a living too. We had a store, and uh, we had to go on and uh, do the best we can. Did your family try to emigrate in the 1930s at all? Did they try to leave? Huh? Did your family try to leave early before the war broke out? Uh, yes, but my grandmother did not want to leave at all mm -hmm. at that time. But, uh, some of our siblings did go to Israel, but they came back to Hitler. Really? Yes. Why? <coughs> but what do you mean why? They didn't know that the Hitler was going to come. They came they to left home. and they came back? Yeah. Okay. Came, they came back to their <coughs> home. They had their phone also there. They had everything. I'm sorry to interrupt. Which country are we talking about? I know there's a town. But which Poland. Country? Poland. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to mention that at the very end, we're going to have 10 minutes to take questions from the audience from anybody. But thank you for clarifying. Poland. Um, it's now Ukraine, but it was Poland. Aha. Uh -huh. The border of Ukraine. Okay, so it's Ukraine now. In that area, yes. Okay. When the war broke out, yeah. tell us what happened with you and your family. Well, when the war broke out, Hitler came in into the, you know, into the city. But I was went into the country, and I thought that I'm going to be able to, you know, not to be able to to see me. But he did, and I ran away from the from the place, and there was a, in, in a garden, and I hid myself in the garden, and then after that, I was able to try to go, and then I left for the woods. Mm -hmm. So you were in a, I remember you saying that you were in a ghetto at one point. Well, I was in the ghetto, yeah, absolutely, I was in the ghetto. But that was after the ghetto. Right, and I, the, one of the most amazing parts of your story that I remember as a kid, right, Abba, this is, is the night before the ghetto was liquidated. Your uncle, Moshka, who, yeah. Moshe, who my son is named after. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened with Uncle Moshe and why you well, left the he, ghetto. That's, that's why I'm alive, because of him. He was the one that really saved me and saved himself. And uh, we was just then went to the woods. How long were you in the woods for? Oh, about close to two years. Really? Yeah. Without a roof over your head? Huh? Without a roof over your head. Who, who thought about the roof? <laughs> <laughs> you just. I wish I would have a blanket to put to lie down on a blanket, which I didn't. Right. Because if you put a blanket when you walk out of the ghetto, then you are already suspicious that you are running away. So we couldn't do that. So we just... Walked out with whatever you were wearing? Yes. Who did you walk out with? Who would I walk out? There was another uh, uh, woman with me. And of course, my uncle. Here. Your uncle and Abba, it was? Florence and Fantalea. Florence and Fantalea, your cousin and your aunt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So how old was Florence when you left the ghetto to go to the forest? How old was, how old was Florence? Florence. 
do you mean to tell me that I should remember? Do <laughs> <laughs> you mean really, really to do that? She was no. a baby, right? No. <laughs> Definitely. She was very young. How old was she? Was she a baby? Or? How old were you? Well, I, I can know how the difference yeah. in age. How old were you when you went to the woods? How old were you? You were a teenager, right? Yeah. About 14? Well, yeah, 14, 15. Right, so, she, so Florence was about eight years younger than you, right? Yeah. So she was about uh, six. Six. Yeah. Six year old. She was a young girl. <coughs> Tell us about what it was like in the woods. And I remember you said you had a run in with the Nazis when you were in the woods. And that's why you're hard of hearing in your left ear. Well, every time I try to speak to you, you always tell me, speak on this side, right? <laughs> well, how old I was then? Well, you don't have to know how old you were, but tell us what happened when the Nazis found you at one point. And remember at one point with the bat? Do you remember that story? Well, when the Nazi really did not find me, Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. That's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I was in the woods, and then I came out from the woods after they say that the war is over, and it's safe to get out. And I have good friends going, and they took me in, <coughs> and they fed me and took care of me. What happened with your hearing in your right ear? That's what that I was uh, hit when I was working for the in the field. Ah. And I didn't work so fast. So one Nazi came and he gave me a good snap in my face. And that's why they ate my ears. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It, uh, it was very tough, but Baruch Hashem, I'm here, and I have you, and, and you, <laughs> Now you know where Dina gets her personality. <laughs> and that's how I was able to live through with a little sense of humor. Otherwise, it was very hard, very hard. There was no food, and you're afraid to go out of the woods. So we had to go deep into the woods where the water was. So the Germans did not want to go on where the water. They were afraid for water. And so that's why we were way, way away over the water. Mm -hmm. We were lying in, in the water without any, any clothes, nothing, I, I, I tell you. Now, when I think, I don't understand. I guess Hashem, I'm angry with him, but I guess he protects me. From what I can say. Um, tell us the story about Pesach in the woods. That's my favorite oh, yeah. one. My uncle may rest in peace. He was such a wonderful person. <coughs> it wouldn't be for him, I wouldn't be here. Well, anyway, he went to the village for the Goyim. He begged for some flour, and he brought it, and he went far away where we were because the aroma shouldn't attract the Germans that there's somebody there. So we had to walk a lot, a lot far in order to be able to bake the matzah. And he did it, my uncle. How much matzah did you have? <laughs> Don't ask this a question. <laughs> a little bit less than us. This, I was lucky to be able to have the Seder with my grandmother this year. And we were all complaining that we ate too much matzah. You're sitting and munching, you have to have this big korach sandwich. We're munching and munching and munching, and we felt sick afterwards. And she said that in the woods, he was only able to make a small amount of matzah. 
And her issue that Pesach was, should I eat it all now? Or should I eat a little bite now and then save a little bit for the next day and then for the next day so I can have a little bit of matzah each day of Pesach? That was her issue. And she was laughing at all of us that we were complaining <laughs> that we had too much matzah. That was yeah. the best, the best Tavar Torah that was said at the Seder was don't complain that you have too much matzah. Don't <laughs> complain, right? Right. Right, right. I tell you, there's a lot of things I have to say, but you know what it is? <clears throat> we can read Nasach, but the moil doesn't move. Got that? Everybody? No, no. Me neither. You can speak a lot, but the mouth doesn't move. In other words, you don't. The emotion <laughs> He's a good tree. He's a good tree. That's why you yeah. <laughs> It's uh, hard to, to uh, articulate everything you feel. Well, anyway, this. Baruch Hashem, I'm here, and I meet so many people, which I never expected that I'd be able to do it. So, thank God for that. And of course, I have such a smarty, smarty here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about after liberation, what happened with Uncle Maishka? Yeah. Well, that was, it's, uh, it's a matter of fact, we were walking out to go out already because the Germans left and the Russian came in. On top of that, somebody said that we were the Germans' collaborator. So they started thinking of me for that, that I, I was a German collaborator. So I said, how can I be a German collaborator when I was running from them? So it's impossible that I was a collaborator with them. Well, anyway, so this I was able to get out. And uh, the rest is, uh, it was no picnic. What happened with Uncle Maishka? He died. <coughs> Do you remember how? <coughs> died right with my dad. Um, did you form any unique friendships in the DP camp after the war? Yes. With who? <laughs> well, they are not here. Yeah. <laughs> right. But you met, huh? you met Zadie in the DP camp after the war. We met Zadie after we already, the Germans left. That's, he came from another camp to the same place where I was. And that's why I met him. This is the best mistake in my life. And that's why you're so pretty. <laughs> 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 I never imagined that I'll be able to be get out of that place and I'll be able to meet people and be able to talk to people. That's my main thankful to Hashem that I was able to do. And of course, some kind of oitza as you are. <laughs> Do you know what means oitza? No. no. A treasure. Oh. Oitza is a treasure. Do you know that I remember you telling me stories about how you were expecting a baby on the boat ride over from, from Austria. You are in Austria in the DP camp. Yeah. going over to America, and you said you used to suck on lemons in order to stop from being nauseous. Do you remember yeah. this? Yeah. And I watched a documentary about the Jews in the, D in the DP camps after the war, and how remarkable it was that the survivors of the war were, instead of focused on their own personal rights, and you know, getting everything that they had back, and running back home, 
they were so focused on building. And there is a very famous reporter that went from New York City to interview survivors in the DP camp because she wanted to show America how much they were suffering and how we should support them and bring them over in a faster pace. And she said that she came in and she heard singing. She heard wedding songs from all four corners of the DP camp. And she said that she came with her crew and you know a whole camera and a woman came up to her and said, you have a camera? Can you take a picture of my new baby? And she said to her, a baby? Where was this baby born? She said, right here in the DP camps. Where is your husband? I met him in the DP camps. So I made this calculation. I realized that you were one of those people that the reporter was speaking about that she got married in the DP camp. What dress did you wear in the DP camp? What? What dress did you wear? What dress did I wear? You told me it was one dress. Everybody, there was laces <laughs> what, in the back. A wedding dress. What a wedding, wedding dress. You said there was one dress with laces in the back, right? Yeah. And all the heavy set brides, you let out the laces. <laughs> and all the skinny brides, they pulled in the laces. And everybody wore the same dress. And no, no wedding ring. There was no such thing as diamonds. She, you got that years and years later. Right? Okay. But everybody knew when you meet two people, two people met each other, what, you asked each other, do you want to build? That was what you wanted to ask. you want to build with me? Can we rebuild what we lost? And that was the beginning, that was the foundation of these Jewish homes. And that's why you were expecting on the boat over. Right. Because you built your, you, you began your Jewish home in the middle of the DP camp, which was essentially set up like a concentration camp, just nobody was being killed. But that's remarkable. To build when you're in squalor and to build when you're at the bottom is an amazing, amazing trait. And, and build high. Yes. <laughs> this is true. Isn't it slow? Yeah. <laughs> Good gazook, well said. Good gazook, right. Adina, Adina. 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 wasn't there a story about a farmer? Saving the farmer's life? Yes. Very well. Said, do you know, well, uh, speaking of, I'll, I'm going to ask my dad if you want to, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Go for it. Um, what was it like to be um, a child of two Holocaust survivors? Not yeah. easy. Not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. Say that again. <laughs> within the family dynamic and also within the Jewish community in Virginia, yeah. what was that like? Well, there we were really. Abba <laughs> <laughs> wants to talk. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. You can answer for a man's final answer. Okay, go um, into it. Answer. You never stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just to fill in the gap, after my parents um, married and they. Uh, they, they went to, they were able to immigrate to the United States and they lived in the New York River. They actually came into Boston and then traveled to New York and lived with, with my great aunt, uh, my tante aunt, for a short period of time. And then they went to a small town in Virginia, southern Virginia. Many people, you probably never heard of it, it's called Newport News. Uh, small town, southern, Baptist Belt. When I go back, I start talking like this. <laughs> Everybody looks at me and goes, why are you talking like that? And I said, like what? <laughs> um, anyway, so it, it was a small southern town. And unfortunately, we were a minority within a minority within a minority. Um, very small Jewish population, about 1,500 people um, out of uh, about 150,000. So uh, less than less than 1%, I think. And... Um, we were a minority because we were in a small Orthodox shul in the, um, in the Jewish community. And uh, we were a minority because there were only a few Holocaust families. So it was a minority and a minority and minority. Um, so there was a, a lack of sense of belonging at every level. Um, the anti-Semitism there was pretty raw. In the streets, school, I went to public school for a few years. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty rough. This was. Uh, I still remember, this is before the Civil Rights Act. Tell uh, the story about uh, all the boys went to parties, what did you yeah. have them? Yeah, so it, actually, actually the, we were also another minority, actually we were really another fourth minority, one of the few Shomer Shabbos families 
in a community um, in the in the synagogue where uh, even though it was an Orthodox shul, most of the people were not shower shop. So it was uh, um, so Friday night, uh, most of the people were out doing stuff, and uh, we were home. Um, but on the other hand, it also gave us a, a very strong foundation. I would say that in my community, either people became religious and moved away, or intermarried. There was no, in, there are very few in between. You see, you're either on board or you're off the ship. And um, I'm very grateful that uh, my parents, even though they went through hell, um, many of the Orthodox survivors gave their faith, gave up on their faith because they were just too traumatized. And even though my parents, my mother said she's got the questions for God, my father did too, but they maintained their, um, their observance. I grew up in an observant home. And even though it was tough because of that minority status, um, it did provide a very strong foundation for me, which I thank God passed on to Munchkins like her. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see that my, because my parents held on to the faith, we have uh, several of our kids that are in Jewish outreach and who are um, touching lives of people who are coming back home. So because of my parents' observance and having an open home, we had a very interesting experience, this I'd like to share with you. This is one of the reasons why I'm very proud of my mother. She, in, in Yiddish, it's called a greener. A greener is like a green heart, like very right off the ship. My mother hardly spoke English. And instead of being a taker and, you know, like living off of other people's charity, and my parents, my father got a job, and my, my mother, they scraped and started buying property. And very quickly, um, when I was a little kid, their house was uh, ground, cent grand cent ground central grand cent for um, here in Newport News, Virginia in the, in the 60s. Um, we had people from the College of William and Mary, which is next door in Williamsburg. We had students, we had professors, remember that, coming for Seder, coming for Shabbos. And I remember in 1964, I think, there was a, um, there was a, a, a steamship from the Zim Lines in Israel called the Shalom. And it had a, an accident in New York Harbor. It was tugged to my hometown, which had a, a shipyard. And for six months, we had, remember that? We had sailors in our house. The Shomer Shabbos sailors would come to our house every Shabbos and line up on cots in our living room. And my mother would cook up a storm, and the people would fight to come to our house because of my mother's cooking. So it, it took very little time before my parents decided that they were going to give back. Like that they didn't want to go to the parties. They go, want to come to, to my house because they had going to have a good meal. <laughs> that is true. And when I was a teenager, I worked at the JCC, and I brought guys home to dinner Friday night, and several became uh, Shomer Shabbos. So Adina comes by and honestly. And... Did you feel comfortable to talk about your story after the war? And if not, at what point did you start speaking about it? Well, I do. I don't feel uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I feel that something like this has to be told <coughs> because not too many people believe that, that this happened. Mm -hmm. And it has to be told by a person that lived through this. And that's how <coughs> it could be established that it was happening something like this. Just want to make a quick comment that we have another survivor here, a very dear friend, Mrs. Berger, who was uh, from Vienna, who survived the war, and uh, has her own uh, horror stories to tell about. But uh, she's also, if you, afterwards, if you want to talk to Mrs. Berger, she's got a lot of stories to tell and uh, has a good memory of things. So we have actually two heroes here. <laughs> Thank God we're here. That's all I can say.
And thank God that uh, we're able to have children, <coughs> grandchildren, and on top of this, the grandchildren are beautiful. <laughs> Never mind the children. Not know to be humiliated. Right? <laughs> you really didn't think you didn't know that? <laughs> now who looks like you? I do. I look like you. I know that. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? <coughs> yes. Um. I remember, loud, you, loud, loud, loud. I remember you telling a story about a farmer who's, who allowed you to stay in his barn for a while and then you had to leave. Do you remember you stayed in a hayloft in the farm? Yeah. So Alan wants you to tell that story, how you got there and how the, and the relationship you had with the farmer. Oh yeah. I have I all of my life. And he really took a, a chance. But I spoke very well Ukrainian, so he said, if they catch you, you'll be able to pass for a shiksa. You know, because I speak very well their language, so they wouldn't think that I am a Jew. And, then, and, after the war, she said, and what happened at the end of the war? What happened at the end of the war with the farmer? The farmer? Yeah. What happened? Well, I still went to, over there and I didn't have any money. And I went over there to get some food. They still were giving me some food. Because I didn't have any, any food. I didn't have any money to buy. But they did still support me. Did, did you end up saving him? Huh? Did you save him? Did I say yes, I did. Did you tell that story? Well, they said when the Germans came that he was collaborating with them. And when the Russian came, they were telling him that he was a collaborator with the Germans. Yeah. So that's when he was ready to be killed. He was in a, in a shack, ready to be killed. And I came rushing quickly, and that's when, when he saw me through the, through the door while uh, coming, he said, here my salvation's coming. He knew that that's gonna help him, which it did, and right away they released him. So he saved my life, and I saved his. How did you save his life? What yeah. was it about you that saved his life? Huh? What was it about you being there that saved his life? Because they said that he was a collaborator with And you backed him up? Yes. That's it. Now you know why we call them heroes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did they know to leave the ghetto? How did you know to leave the ghetto? That's a good question. How did, How did you know to leave the ghetto when you left? How did I know to leave the ghetto? Yeah. Because that's what my uncle was working for, the, for, for them. And he overheard that tonight will be a liquidation from the ghetto. That's why they got out before right. the liquidation. So he said, if you can't get out of the ghetto, then just try to do it. So you can't take along anything with you because it's, you, you know, you say, they say that you're running away. So we didn't take along anything and slept on the grass. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, it's, it's amazing when you think about, do you know what the winter temperatures are like in the northern Ukraine? 20 below? Yeah. Easily. So how did you survive those winters? How did you survive the winters? Uh -huh. How did you survive the, the, the grueling winters? I'm here. 
<laughs> Asked and answered. <laughs> How did you get out? Uh, How did you get out of the ghetto? I, I told you. Somebody, she just ran. You know. Somebody, uh, you know, a trusting person. We didn't have any water in the ghetto. So I had to get out to get some water. And that was my way to get out of the ghetto because I had to get some water. And then once you got out, you and ran. And then when I got out, and that woman walked with me, and she helped me out. But I couldn't take along anything, not to give any, you know, uh, how you say in English, not to give them any sign that I had run away from the ghetto. This might be a hard question to answer, but not your whole family. Well, left. Your family did not leave the ghetto with you, some people got left behind. Who were well, they? my family, unfortunately, see, I spoke very well Ukrainian, but they didn't, and I was afraid they gonna somebody talk to them, and when they answer, it's gonna be with the Yiddish accent. So that's the reason why my family and my father died before. You know what the people wished when somebody died? Mazel tov. <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because he wasn't dead from a German football. Yeah. That was the mazel tov. You had a question? Where is she? Where is she? Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Tommy. Um, make it a little bit louder after I finish the line. No. Um, how is it for you now to see three, four generations come in <coughs> who's passing on the Jewish belief and uh, the outreach? Yes. What's it like for you to see now a third and fourth generation carrying on the tradition of your family? Beautiful. <laughs> the heritage. It, 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 particularly in these circumstances where you grew up, you know, there was a, a hover. You didn't have any hover. And do you have any hover there? Couple. A couple. A couple friends, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it was hard, but for Russia, I see nothing. To the question is to, to see, as you said, you're in the JCC and now, you know, Adina and Shlomo, of course, starting this Yehudi. So that's how, how is that to see them and you filling up rooms of oh, Jews? Is that for me? You're asking? For, yeah, for her to see. Outreach specifically. What, what they're asking is that what's it like for you to see your Ainaglach, your grandchildren? Doing hero work, outreach work, bringing Jews back into the fold. What's that like? That's not us. That's not us. Particularly where you grow up, particularly how you raise, and you children are doing something of this. This is not us. You know, how do you define nachas? You can't. There's no way to it. Joy. 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 Wow. It's beyond joy. Satisfaction. You don't know what's not I don't know how to define it. You can't define it, can you? It's like, you know, it's like, you know, there's a term called Yiddish Anachas, which is Jewish pride. That's it. That's it. That's it. Jewish pride. It's more it's pride and joy. It's pride and joy. I'll tell you what Nachas is. Nachas is the, I think, you can correct it's me if I'm joy. wrong. It's a joy. But it comes deeper than just a regular joy that you have because the nachas, it's a spiritual joy. you know that that nachas, the pleasure that you're getting from your children doing something, something inside you, inside you tells right you that thing. you did something that it comes from you, which means the nachas that my grandmother has to see, to see the amount of people that came here tonight. And to see the amount of people that come every Tuesday night to come and learn, that Nachas goes very deep because she knows that it's she inspired it. 
that she sat cooking chicken soup for a bunch of random sailors so they had a place to go to for a Shabbos meal in the middle of Newport News, Virginia. And it's not easy to make chicken soup for a lot of people because I know I have to do every <laughs> she, knows, she knows that this is a close for her. Nafas goes very deep because it's, you know that there's something that you must have done right in order for your the, the people that you're getting nachas from to be doing what they're doing. I think that's why nachas is hard to translate because it's a it's it's something that is very very large and very long and goes very deep as well. I would add one thing to it as the child of a survivor that my mother's attitude was <coughs> we're here we have children we have grandchildren they didn't win. That's true. That's what my mind love be, actually. What city did you get married in? Where was the DP camp? Ah, uh, wait a minute. I have to think about it. <laughs> I'll help you, Mom. The name of the town that my parents met when the DP camp is called Braunau, which, which is on the Aust Austrian-German border. Right. Anybody know what the significance right. of Braunau is? It was the birthplace of Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Wow. So my what did you used got to married. say? Uh -huh. Bobby, what did you used to tell me when you talked about the city that you got married in? You said, I'm getting married here right now, the day that you got married, and where is Hitler? <laughs> Beneath my feet. <laughs> Underneath the ground. He's down there. Yeah. That is... That's a trip to be running in the woods for two years for your life and to have lost so many people that you love, not knowing that if you'll ever make it till the next day, and then to find yourself getting married in a DP camp in the same birthplace of the person who put you on the run in the first place, it's like a twilight zone. It's a, it's a dream come true. My grandmother's been living that dream come true ever since because at every single Thanksgiving, and every single Pesach Seder, and every single bar or bat mitzvah that she celebrated with her grandchildren, she always has the same speech. Sorry to pull your cover.